Well, for some of you in your journey of faith, you uh, grew up and were in a church tradition where you experienced the different parts of the church here, and Ash Wednesday was part of your experience. For other ones of you, that's, that's a totally new thing. Uh, but this, uh, this time together, this service together, is really the beginning of a season called Lent. The 40, 40 days are really 46 days until Easter, and you take the Sundays out, you have 40 days till Easter. And we're going to be talking about preparing ourselves to come to the empty tomb at Easter, but we're backing up to now. And we're gonna, tonight we're going to think about the greatness of God's grace and forgiveness, which matches and surpasses the greatness of our sins and our need. And this is a time of, of just honest reflection, of searching your heart, of searching your life. And if you look at your heart and if you look at your life and you say, you know, there's really nothing wrong, nothing to repent of, no problems here, thank you very much. Uh, you're missing something. To understand the greatness of God's grace, we have to recognize what he's forgiven us of. And so the reality is we all mess up, we all trip spiritually and fall, and we all sin against God, every one of us. That's part of our journey. And Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. Every single person. Only Jesus walked on this earth without sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. So I want to ask you to just do a little exercise. If you would quiet your heart, if it helps to bow your head, and just to reflect, and ask yourself, is that me? Is that me? Sometimes my words are harsh. They come out of my mouth, and I wish I hadn't said them right after I've said them. You say, yeah, that's me. Sometimes I hear a juicy morsel of gossip, and I pass it on, and I see the damage it caused, and I have to say, man, I didn't mean to. I wish I hadn't, but that's me. Sometimes my words are cutting like a razor intentionally. I'm mad, I'm upset, and I'm getting back. And I cut like a blade with my words. We sin with our words. If that's you, just before the Lord right now, say, Lord, that's me. I acknowledge it. Sometimes we sin with our thoughts. Maybe you have to say tonight, that's me. We, our, our minds wander places they shouldn't wander. We think thoughts we wish we wouldn't think. And we say, yeah, that's me. There's times that's true. There's times that thoughts go through our mind and we say, I can't even believe I would think that. And we don't want to admit it to ourselves or to other, anybody else, and we certainly don't want to admit it to God. But God knows. That's why Jesus came. When your mind thinks thoughts you shouldn't think, you say, Lord, yeah, that's me. I confess it. I acknowledge it. Sometimes we sin in our actions. We do things we know we shouldn't do. Things that we said, I'll never do it again. And we find ourselves right there again. And we say to God, yeah, that's me. We could echo the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7. The things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I fail to do. Who will deliver me from this body of sin? And my actions can be wrong before God and wrong before they say, yeah, that's me. And sometimes we sin in what we don't do. The Holy Spirit whispers, stop. Help that person. Do something. And we drive by, we walk by, we're too busy. And we have to say, Lord, that's me. Sometimes I, I sin on the things and the things I miss doing. It's a chance to say something kind to a child or a grandchild, to our spouse. But we're just too frustrated about things, we're too busy, and we just don't do it. Tonight, as we come to the cross, as we share communion together, as we're in the presence of God's people, wherever we are, at home, out in the courtyard, here in the worship center, it's a chance to say, Lord, yeah, that's me. When your word says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, I know I'm numbered among those people. And the truth of the matter is that God's greatest people know this is true. They know the reality of sin. And tonight we're gonna reflect on a man named David. David, the shepherd of God's sheep. David, the king of God's people, David, called a man after God's own heart. 
David, who became king of Israel. You look at David and you say, well, David, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Amazing. The Bible also says David was a man who took another person's wife and committed adultery with her. What was David? A man after God's own heart? Or an adulterer who steals another man's wife? Well, David was both. He was both. David was the one who conquered Goliath. Victorious. Faith. He was the one that was caught by the prophet Nathan, who pointed out that not only had had he taken another man's wife, he had killed her husband to cover his tracks. That same David, conqueror of Goliath and killer of Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba. Which was he? He was both. He was the sweet psalmist of Psalm 23. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He he leads me besides green waters, still pastures. He pours out this heart inspired by the Spirit. That's David. And he also wrote Psalm 51 the psalm that we're going to spend a few moments lingering on tonight. Psalm 51 begins before the psalm starts with these words. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. That's the introduction to the psalm. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 51. You see, when David should have been off to battle with his soldiers, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was back in Jerusalem, wandering around on the roof of his house. He looks out and sees a woman bathing. From the height of his house, he could see kind of into her secluded backyard. He's attracted to her. He tells his servants, bring that woman to me. They say, oh, you mean Bathsheba, the daughter of this person, the wife of Uriah, She's someone's little girl. She's someone's wife. And David says, bring her to me. And he's the king. So they bring her. The Bible doesn't give a lot of commentary. It just says, and he slept with her. Sends her home. Discards her. And she gets word back after a short time. I'm pregnant. But here's the problem. Her husband is where David should have been. He's off to battle. He's not home. There's no way he's the father. So what does David do? He says, bring Uriah back from the battle. Just want to see how he's doing. Gets him a little bit liquored up. Says, hey, Uriah, you've been out in the field for a while. Go home and visit your wife. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And Uriah goes and sleeps with David's soldiers because he won't go have pleasure with his wife when the men of God were in the fields fighting for the people of God and for Jerusalem and for their king. He wouldn't do what he could rightly, rightfully do and David did what he was forbidden to do. David brings him back again. This time he gives him a little bit more to drink. and says, Uriah, go home. Enjoy your wife. And Uriah won't do it. And his refusal to go and be with his wife was the signing of his own death warrant. Because David wrote a note to his military commander, Joab. Closed it, sealed it with the seal of the king. The note basically said, put Uriah in the worst part of fighting, have a signal to pull back from the walls of the city you're going to attack, and don't tell Uriah the signal. And Uriah carries back to the military commander his own death warrant. And he's killed. And David thinks, now I've covered my tracks. All good. But God sends the prophet Nathan to him. And Nathan tells David a little story. This is all in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. Read it this evening. Meditate on it. We're going to look at Psalm 51, but I just want to set the scene. And Nathan comes and tells David, just, just tells him a little story about a rich traveler who comes through the land and, there's, and he stops with a, a, a rich person and the rich person doesn't want to feed this person with his own, from his own flock so he goes to his neighbor who has just one little lamb and it's not a lamb for the farm, it's a lamb for the family. It's a, it's a family pet. 
And so Nathan tells the story to David. So this guy comes, he's traveling, he stops at this person's house. The person goes to the next door neighbor and takes their one little lamb and slaughters it and feeds it to this guest. And David is outraged. The Bible says in, in 2 Samuel 12, verse 3, David, verse 5, David burned with anger against this man. And David says to Nathan, the prophet, David says to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. David is outraged at the injustice of somebody taking somebody else's lamb. You getting the picture here? And here stands Nathan in front of him. David's outraged. David says he must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan the prophet said to David, you are the man. I'm talking about you, David. You took another man's wife and had him killed. Now at that moment, David had one of two choices. He was the king of Israel. He could have said to the guards, guards, take Nathan out and do away with him, and Nathan would be gone. See, he was covering his tracks. Took out Uriah, covered his tracks. But he learned that you can't cover your tracks with God. God knows. He could have kept fighting and resistant, resisting, but he didn't. He wrote a song, inspired by the Holy Spirit, out of his own pain and his own sin. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Listen to his prayer and ask yourself, could this be your prayer? Could this be your prayer tonight? An acknowledgement of the reality of the depth of the sin that we carry because until we understand the depth of our sin, then we forget the greatness of God's grace and what Jesus did on the cross for us. So he prays, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict. And you are justified when you judge. Do you hear the heart of David? He stopped running. He stopped covering his tracks. His sin is bare before God and he knows it. At that moment, we have a choice. We keep covering our sin, which we can't really do before God, or we just come clean before God. A cry from the heart of David. And look at the words. My transgressions, my iniquities, my sin. I know the evil that I've done. David gets it. He sees it. Do we? There's no better time than tonight to really reflect on the reality of our sin and the greatness of God's grace. He's also aware of God's judgment. He says, God, if you judge me, you're right. I deserve judgment. See, we don't come to the communion table to declare that we don't deserve judgment. We come to say, only by the grace of Jesus is my sin washed away. We don't come to gather with God's people to say, look how holy I am. We come to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, and he has washed me clean through Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. That's the goodness of God. That's the grace of God. This prayer of David, this prayer is a cry for grace and mercy from the heart of a person who recognizes their sin. David sees it, he gets it, he's not denying it, he's not running for it. And then he continues on. In verse seven of Psalm 51, David prays, cleanse me with hyssop. Hyssop was the, the plant that they used to put the blood on the doorpost during Passover, going back to the beginning of the history of Israel. Cleanse me with hyssop, hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. He couldn't hear it anymore. Running from God keeps you away from joy and gladness. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Oh God, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. 
Could that be your prayer? The prayer of David. The prayer inspired by the Holy Spirit. David acknowledges the source of his cleansing. God, you are the source of cleansing. In a little bit, we're gonna come to the table. We're gonna partake of the bread. We're gonna partake of the cup. And we're gonna remember that by the broken body of Jesus, by the shed blood of Jesus, we are cleansed. David recognized that cleansing only came from God. And he had a longing for hope, a longing for joy, a longing for restoration. My prayer is that tonight, every one of us, as we continue worshiping together, we say, Lord, I have a longing to be connected with you. If you've come to the cross, if you've received Jesus, you are his child, you are cleansed, you belong to him, but we can feel distant because we haven't come and laid ourselves before him. Let this be the night that you do that. This prayer of David is a deep awareness that cleansing, joy, and hope come from a restored relationship with God. When you come to the cross for the first time, you become a child of God. But as we walk with Jesus, there's times you just to come and say, God, I lay it down. I place it before you. In a little bit in our service, we're gonna have an extended time of worship after communion. And, and we're gonna invite you to come to kind of the prayer area across the front here. And if you wanna come and kneel and just come before the Lord and talk with him, we wanna have space for that. We're gonna have some other ways that you can express yourself. But, but to say, God, I, w- I want to be intimate with you. I wanna feel your presence. Let this be a night that you cry out for that. And then Psalm 51 continues in verse 13. So David has poured out his heart. He's acknowledged his sin. He stopped running from God. And and then then his heart begins to change. It it begins to kind of climb backward, uh, back upward. He says, says, if if God, if you'll forgive me, if you'll restore my relationship with you, he says, verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. When I'm restored to you, I can invite other people to come to you, Lord. Lord. And then he says in verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. This is not metaphorical. He's had a man killed. But he says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. I can sing again. I can worship again. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Listen to verse 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. What's the offering we bring to God? An honest heart that says, God, I turn from my sins. I confess my sins. I ask for your power in my life to help me turn and live in a new way. And when this happens, then we can bless others. Then God can use us. Then our guilt is lifted. Then we can sing songs of praise and worship him again. Then we can come and bring a a sacrifice to the Lord. Not a sacrifice of animals, but a sacrifice of ourselves. Just, Just an honest heart that says, God, here's who I am. You see it anyways, but I'm gonna stop hiding. I'm gonna stop running. I'm gonna stop covering my tracks. And I'm gonna turn my heart back to you. Here's a question. Do I recognize the life-transforming power of confession and repentance? Confession is saying, God, I confess my sins. I acknowledge my sins. I I place them before you. I'm not hiding or covering them. Confession is declaring to God that we recognize our brokenness, our sins in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, in our inaction. That's confession. Repentance is once we've confessed, we say, now I'm gonna turn around. And I'm going to stop speaking that way. I'm going to try to stop thinking that way. I'm going to try to stop acting that way. I'm going to try to start acting the way I'm supposed to. There is life transforming power when we will confess to God, turn from our sins, and begin to walk in a fresh new way with Jesus. And can I tell you, followers of Jesus, God's always ready with open arms. See, some of you come from church traditions where you've been taught that when you recognize your sin and you're ready to confess it, you can confess it, but now you've got penance. Now you've got to do so many of these, so many of those, feel guilty for a while, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then God will open his arms. No, that's not biblical. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. That's what God wants to do. And so quiet your heart and bow your head 
And listen to these words from 1 John. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So living God, we join our hearts together in prayer and we join in the prayer of David from Psalm 139. I invite you right now to make this your prayer. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Living God, we come before you tonight. And as we prepare our hearts to come to the table, as we prepare ourselves to meet with you, as you meet with us in this time of communion. Jesus, show us your face. Reveal your grace. Speak your truth to us. Lord, we thank you that when we confess our sins, you always remind us of the greatness of your grace. And Lord, as we're together tonight, wherever we're gathered, whether we're outdoors or whether we're online or whether we're here in the worship center, we want to acknowledge to you, Lord, for all of us who've come to the cross and received Jesus, that no matter how great our sins are, your grace covers them infinitely over and over and over. Oh God, our sin is real. Our sin is deep. Our sin is great. But your grace is life. Your grace is truth. Your grace is transformational. And so tonight as we linger in your presence, as we come to the table, as we hold the bread and partake of it, as we hold the cup and partake of it, will you remind us of the greatness of grace that covers all of our sins absolutely, completely, and totally. We read in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We know that many people gather with Shoreline Church. At any given service, there's people who have come to the cross and received Jesus, and there may be people who have not yet become a follower of Jesus. As we prepare to take communion, if you're at home, uh, we invite you to get uh, some crackers, some juice, something that you can partake of. Uh, If you're on campus, you should have received a little cup as you came in. If you didn't, you can just kind of look back and we have, if you, we'll have people to kind of walk up and make sure you get a little communion cup if you need one still. They're waiting in the aisle, so you just raise your hand if you need one. And, and this, but this experience is for those who've put their faith in Jesus. So if you're with us tonight, we are so glad you're with us and we give you the warmest of welcomes. But as as your pastor, I would say, uh, don't partake of these elements if you don't know what they mean. But when you do come to know Jesus, know what they mean. This is rich, and this is life, and this means so much to us. I want to encourage you, if you're on campus and you have a little communion set, that you'll take it and just turn it over so that the bread is up, and just peel off the top, and take that little piece of bread, a little wafer, and hold that in one hand. And as you hold it, just hold it tenderly and carefully, and just we're remembering the body of Christ, and then turn that cup over, and if you'll just peel that top piece off and hold that in your other hand, so in one hand you have the bread, in one hand you have the cup, and hold those as we prepare to partake together. And as we come to the table, we remember the cross, the cross that was the instrument for the death of Jesus, the cross that allowed us to have a renewed relationship with God because Jesus gave up his life for us. And we remember-
remember the tomb where Jesus was laid after he was taken off the cross. And as those who were close to him mourned because they, they thought it was the end, we remember where he was laid. And as we come to the table, we remember what a great sacrifice he gave for us so that we could have eternal life as payment for our sins. Each time we partake in communion, it's the perfect time to just pause and search our hearts, examine ourselves. David hit that moment where he had to decide, do I keep covering my tracks and running? Or do I say, forgive me, Lord, I confess. Just quiet your heart and say, Lord, if there's things that have been wrong in my, in my words, in my actions, in my inaction, in my thoughts, even now begin to just lay them before the Lord. Say, Lord, I confess this, I acknowledge this. My mind wanders where it shouldn't. My lips speak how they shouldn't. My hands do things they shouldn't do. My feet take me places I shouldn't go. Just begin to lay those things before the Lord. This is the time of deep examination of our own souls. There's two parts, really, to this examination of ourselves. It's to look inwardly. It's to ask God to reveal to us those areas where we've fallen short where we've sinned, where we haven't matched up with his will for our lives, to not only recognize those shortcomings, but then to confess them, to own them, to take responsibility for them, to give them to God. We also identify those areas in our life where, where we're broken, where we're flailing and failing, and we confess those to God. admit that we desperately need the grace that Jesus provided through his death on the cross. This bread which we break, this bread which we partake of, is our communion with the body of Jesus Christ. As you hold the bread in your hand, as you hold that wafer in your hand, will you just look at it and remember the body of Jesus. Jesus, who was infinitely, gloriously in heaven and came in flesh in a manger. He took on flesh. He took on a body. A body that felt weariness and tiredness, just like we do. A body that was scourged and whipped and beaten. A body that was crucified. He died, broken to make us whole. As we partake of this bread, we remember the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's partake of the bread together. reminds us of Jesus' blood shed for us. This is really a big sacrifice that he made on our behalf, that he shed his blood. He's the lamb who takes away the sins of the world through his blood. As we partake of this, we remember that he did this willingly. He made the sacrifice for us so that ultimately we could be reunited with our Father. As we partake of this cup, remember that sacrifice. Remember that gift. Let us partake together. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, for your body broken, we give you praise. For your blood shed, we stand in awe. That by your wounds, we are healed. So in this moment, we remember 
that this, this gift of communion isn't given to us because we earned it or we deserved it. It's given because while we were still sinners, Jesus, you died for us. It's given to us because you, the one who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Meet us in this time of worship. Speak to our hearts. We say with the psalmist, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any, any offensive way in me. And O Lord, lead me in the way everlasting.